Hello and welcome. We are so glad to have you here for this STFM webinar as part of the new resident leadership series for STFM's um, webinars. With today's topic is clear eyes, full day, can't lose, time management strategies for busy folks. We are so happy to have today our panelists, Grace Shee, um, who is the director of the Whammy Family Medicine Residency Network and associate professor at the Department of Family Medicine for the University of Washington and Claire Thompson, who's the Director of the Obstetrics Fellowship at Swedish First Hill Family Medicine Residency. Thank you all for joining us. We are really, really glad to have you here today. And I just wanted to let you all know that we recognize we have a mixed audience of both residents, probably some fellows, perhaps students and faculty, and we're excited to find out more about you as this progresses. But this is a, a webinar that has a particular focus for residents. We actually have here the third year residents of Swedish First Hill Family Medicine Residency who are have done some pre-work and are particularly um, have, are, are, have some questions that they're gonna be ready to answer at the end of this webinar. Um, and so we do want to, when we do Q&A towards the end, we were gonna have a little extra focus on having those resident voices and perspectives float to the top. With that being said, we're so glad that each one of you are all are here. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Thompson and Dr. Sheets. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, and yeah, welcome everyone. Grace and I are really excited to talk with you this morning. Um, and just to start, we're we're going to use some hand raising. Um, functions also to, to help people unmute and um, speak during our talk. So to practice that, um, can anyone raise their hand if they know what this reference is from? Okay, that's, um, that's more than we've gotten in the past. <laughs> we've given this talk a couple of times and have, have met with some blank faces. Um, so this is a, a Friday Night Lights reference um, uh, and Grace and I are both big fans of the show. Um, it uh, is something that Coach Taylor says to his team um, It says clear eyes, full heart can't lose. Um, and so we adjusted that a little bit um, to think about how you can have um, clear eyes even when you have a full day as we all do. Um, and so we're gonna come back to that a couple of times um, during the talk. Um, thank you for those of you who raised your hands. I'm very excited some people got our reference. Um, so. When we use when we change the term to full days, what um, well rather we all have very full days, um, but what we don't always have are clear eyes. And this talk is going to really focus on how to achieve um, clear eyes. And when we use that term, we're sort of thinking of three big um, components. One is a clarity of intention. The second thing is a system to prioritize. And the third thing is uninterrupted time. And we need all of those things to really feel like we can be successful with all of the things that we need to do in our day. So we're all of the strategies we're gonna talk about kind of fit um, in one or more of those buckets. Um, and I wanna acknowledge that for some of these things, we have very little or very limited control, especially um, for residents. Um, and, yet, and yet, there are still ways we can maximize and improve what we are doing. Um, the other thing is that Claire and I are not experts in this, but we are people who are very interested in this topic. And we've also each struggled with this at various points in our career. And people have mentored us, given us great advice. We've done our own reading or um, podcast listening, or we've just kind of tried things um, in the, uh, that have worked for us, much like probably all of you have. So we're going to just share with you kind of the things that we know and how we've incorporated it into our lives. Um, and because we're here um, with a virtual room full of successful people, we know that you have strategies too. So there's going to be lots of opportunities for you to share that with your colleagues. And we want to encourage um, that kind of sharing because I think that's really how we can all help ourselves get through these days. Um, next slide. Um, I really like talking about this topic because we can train the best family medicine doctors in the world, 
But if you all don't feel fulfilled in your day-to-day -day work or you feel unsuccessful, we're going to lose you, right? And so to me, this talk is really about self-preservation. And I want to share um, a couple of graphs that maybe you've seen some version of, um, but this is a, a graph of a burnout among different specialties. And you can see the arrow is family medicine and we're very high on the burnout list. Um, and then the graph to the right is actually looking at um, differences um, of burnout between male and female uh, family physicians by age. And so you can see, especially early in careers, um, burnout is really, really high for female family doctors. Um, now this study was looking specifically at male versus female, but I would hypothesize that the curves are similar or worse for faculty of color or other marginalized groups. And I think this really reflects the fact that our work culture is not really set up for people who do not or cannot primarily focus on work, but we're all sort of in this together. So um, that's kind of the background and, and motivation behind covering this topic. Next slide. Is the question we want you to be able to answer by the end of this talk. So as we talk about different strategies and you can click, um, I want you all to be thinking, is this a strategy that could work for me? The strategies are very, very personal and individualized. So there's not going to be a one size fits all. So just be thinking about like, is this realistic that I could actually do? And again, some of these are sort of general concepts and then people tweak um, and it would be really helpful. And we very much welcome the tweaks that you have done if you've heard some of these strategies and then made it work for you. But our goal for today is that each of you have at least one strategy that sort of lights up for you today. Slide. Thanks, Grace. Um, so kind of the, the first strategy that we're gonna talk about is um, the getting things done framework. Um, which kind of encompasses some other strategies and, and informs some other strategies as well. Um, and so, you know, before I kind of get into the, um, you know, workflows of that framework particularly, just want to talk about um, some of the challenges that it's trying to address, challenges that, you know, we're, we're all familiar with, um, feeling like we have, you know, too many projects going on that have too many timelines, um, and I have projects in quotes here because I think, um, you know, project really is anything that is like a series of actions that you're doing. And some of them um, feel, you know, it's easy to think about all the work projects that you're doing, the you know, papers that you're working on, the, um, you know, rotations that you're on, the curricular stuff. Um, but things like, you know, potty training my two-year-old is also a big project that I need to <laughs> look plan for and have a lot of actions. Um, and so um, we all have these, you know, lots of different project timelines, you know, running for our lives. And then those projects create a lot of tasks and there are just too many of them in the day often. Um, we get distracted with a lot of things. People, um, you know, bring things to our attention. We all have, um, you know, five to 10 different inboxes at this point. Um, and you can get contacted in so many different ways. Um, and so, um, end up getting distracted in the middle of those tasks and projects. Those never done tasks, the things that are um, on your to-do list and you just keep bumping forward and bumping forward and bumping forward and then eventually decide actually I don't want to do that. Um, but it, it kind of takes up that mental space for you. Um, and then as Grace mentioned at the beginning, um, the fact that a, a lot of the really hard work that we're trying to do and the creative work create um, needs this big chunk of uninterrupted time to be done well. Um, and instead what we have is a lot of fragmented time um, because of all of the busy things going on in our days and our lives with our clinical work, our educational work, our families, our uh, stuff outside of work. Um, so just knowing that, you know, this is kind of what we're, what we're up against. And as Grace said that um, there's no perfect solution and that's definitely not what we're here to say today, but that, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can try and approach these problems and find something that works really well for you. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Getting Things Done framework. Um, and um, I'm guessing that uh, many of the folks on here might have heard of this before. Um, and for my residents who are here, who um, thank you all for being um, game for <laughs> Uh, coming to this talk and, and um, hopefully chatting a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask you soon to reflect on that podcast um, that I that I sent out to you um, that goes a little bit more into the getting things done system. Um, but for anyone who hasn't heard of it, wanted to give a little bit of an overview. Um, and really, this first bullet is the most important one um, that, you know, for me, I started to do getting things done when I was chief resident um, and starting to feel really that overwhelming sense of anxiety about all of the different tasks that I was trying to keep in my head. Um, and the GTD philosophy of um, not using the valuable real estate in your brain to hold ideas um, really spoke to me and helped to like quell some of that anxiety by um, realizing that it's not that my, my brain isn't good enough um, because it it can't hold all of the things. That's just not what my brain is designed to do. My brain is designed to have ideas, not to like hold pieces of information. And so getting those pieces of information into a system um, is a really a way to work on that anxiety piece. Um, and then the second piece, I'm gonna kind of go through a little algorithm in a second um, that walks through um, that, that process. Um, but then this last piece of context, I think is also really helpful um, as an organizational skill that's come in over and over again. Um, and that's both thinking about the context of, you know, who do I need to talk to about all of these different things and having um, essentially lists. Um, I know there's, <laughs> there's lots of um, more technologically advanced tools and, um, you know, we could try and sell you on those, but honestly, it's really anything that you can make a list in that you will use. Um, and so you can have lists and Grace is going to show an example of like everything that I need to talk to, you know, my PD about everything that I need to talk to this person about tasks that I can only do when I'm at home. Um, and so having that organizational system helps you to um, really be more efficient and um, targeting where you're going to spend your time and when. Okay, um, so I'm going to put my residents on the spot a little bit. Um, and we sent out some podcasts ahead of time and kind of asked you to self-divide into a couple of groups. Um, one that, you know, organizational stuff is a struggle for you um, or doesn't feel like one of your strengths. Um, and the second one feeling like, you know, organization is one of my strengths. Um, does anybody from the first group um, feel brave and want to talk a little bit about what you thought about the podcast um, and maybe even summarize it a little bit for the rest of the, the group? And if you raise your hand, then um, uh, Emily can unmute you. Oh yeah, sorry, Grace. It's the um, just the the getting things done podcast. <laughs> I will say it sounds a little um, Ponzi schemeish when you first start listening to it because they have like a GTD community that you can join, which I think maybe costs money. But I will say the book is like free at the library. The podcast is free. Lots of great content, and you don't have to to join there. Um, somewhat cultish sounding community, but maybe it's great. <laughs> so any of my brave residents want to kind of summarize what they thought about the podcast? Lena? <laughs> Hi, I'm Lena. I'm one of the third years from First Hill. Um, I actually was introduced to this podcast um, by Claire a while back. Um, and I would definitely consider myself in that first category of organization is not a, not a strong skill for me. Um, I think, I, Claire, I'm sorry, I don't know if I can summarize kind of succinctly, but I think for me, the idea of just like having a spot to dump all these things that are in my brain and that I sometimes will catch like glimpses of or I sometimes can catch like a tail end of during the day um, was really really helpful because I think I will have those thoughts and then I almost like in the past had to trust myself to remember that in a way and I just did not have like a systematic way or a systematic place in which to put that thought um, so I think having like just a little silo for me to dump everything um, has been a big game changer um, and has really um, in a way taken a load off. So um, yeah, that's my, 
that's been my um, experience so far with with GTD. You know, do you mind? Thank you for for sharing that. And um, do you mind um, kind of describing like what the mind sweep was like? So for me, um, I think the mind sweep was kind of thinking really systematically and just going through like, okay, what are all the things that I need to do? Um, and I think it also is a dedicated chance for me to be a little bit like reflective and a little bit um, almost like mindful about all the things that I do need to get done. And I think that's not something that I was doing super intentionally in the past. Um, so I think that's been, um, again, like super helpful and again, just more like a dedicated and very like mindful and intentional space to do that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I just, I just want to call out that I think, um, you know, it, it can be easy to think like, oh, I'm not like smart enough or I'm not, you know, good. I'm not like good at this. Um, when really it's like, you're asking your brain to do something that is like not really fair <laughs> to, to yourself. Um, that like we do have so many things um, you know happening in our our lives professionally and outside that um, to expect ourselves to hold on to all of that um, without having that system to offload is, is not fair to ourselves. Um, does anyone else from from the R three class that maybe listens to the second put themselves in that second category um, want to share any reflections or kind of summarize? You can raise your hand if you would like to be um, unmuted and I can give you that power. Thanks, Joe. Can you guys hear me? Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm Joe. I'm another one of the first tall R3s. Um, I, sorry, I did also listen to the first one so I can just share an additional reflection about that. Um, I, so in doing the mind sweep, um, I first of all found it like very overwhelming and ended it like honestly feeling like maybe worse than I had when I started because like it basically results in me having like all of my like deepest um, and like most guilt inducing tasks kind of like written out in front of me. I do find it really useful to like visualize all of that. Um, I wasn't sure, and I feel like something that I still um, need to work on, I don't know, maybe by listening to the podcast or maybe just like figuring out a system for myself is like how to take it from that next step of externalizing all of these tasks to then like action, like making them actionable and like putting them onto a calendar or something. Um, and I like, I don't know, at one point in the podcast, he was like, okay, now get out your calendar and like write stuff down. And I was like, oh, I don't have that. Like I, now I just have this like giant cloud of tasks that I have to do um, without a way to like organize them. Um, so yeah, that, that was my reflection, but I do like having it. I, I, I do really resonate with like having, like holding things like on an external piece of paper kind of instead of holding them in your mind and seeing it visually written down. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. And I swear that um, that was not a, a plant um, uh, because, yeah, I think that is that that is like really the next step um, to once you have everything offloaded, like have a sort of system for like, OK, what are my next actions with all of these things that I just got out of my head? Um, so that's what we're going to kind of talk about next. This <laughs> very um, busy looking flow sheet um, that I'll just kind of walk through a little bit. Um, it's you know somewhat self-explanatory, but I think some of the things um, are helpful just to to think about. So, Joe and anyone else, you have your big mind sweep list. Like you are looking at your somewhat overwhelming and maybe like ego dystonic list of tasks, <laughs> and thinking about what are you going to do with each of them next, right? Um, so that's all your stuff that's coming in. Um, and so I think that first step is really deciding, like, is there something to do about this? Um, and for some things, there's there's not. Um, Grace is going to talk about gleefully deleting things um, a little bit later on. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of things that come in that actually, like, you don't need this, so trash. Um, 
And then there's some things that you're like, I actually don't really want to act on this right now. So having some, a place that's actually your like someday maybe file, um, I think can be really helpful because you're not losing that, but it's not something you're going to do at the moment. Um, and then we all get a lot of like cool references, articles, stuff like that, that, yeah, again, we don't really need right now, but maybe want to look at later. So that's, you know, some amount of stuff, but the meat is really the things that you're going to act on, right? Um, I think a lot of folks have probably heard this rule of um, if, if it's in front of you and it's less than two minutes to do, then just do it right then, um, which I think is a really helpful rule with the caveat that um, if you're in the middle of like a deep work session or um, a, a project, then bringing up your like two minute tasks is not um, going to be helpful for you at that time. And so sometimes sitting down and saying like, now I'm going to go through all of my kind of two minute tasks or like go through my inbox and like really just like get things done really quickly. Um, and having that be designated time to do that, as opposed to letting those two minute tasks like interrupt you all day as a distraction. Um, delegating, we're also gonna talk about a little bit later on when we talk about email. Um, and then this is the, the big thing, because most things that you um, are going to run into are not things you can do right away and are things that you actually need to do, not for someone else to do. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people have this kind of running to-do list of the day. And so that's kind of your next action list. Um, and, you know, there's all different ways to organize that that can speak to you. Um, and then this other piece, Joe, that I think is really important of what you um, just said of having a calendar or having some way to decide, okay, I, I can't do this thing right now. It is important for me to do in a certain time frame, And so I'm going to decide when I'm going to do that and actually like put the task on my calendar or um, in a space that's going to like remind me at that time that that's what I'm planning to work on. Um, so that you don't have to think about it, it doesn't have to take up that valuable real estate in your head until you get to that time. Um, so next, um, Grace and I are going to show you a couple of examples of how um, we kind of put some of those things into um, action and um, introduce a couple of the other techniques we talked about at the beginning too. Hey, um, so Joe, I was really sympathetic when you were talking about like, oh, I, once I made my crazy list, like I didn't know what to do with it. Um, because that's kind of where I, I was for a long time. I had a list and I was like, I, I don't know how to, I still don't know how to get things done. Now I just know I have stuff to do. Um, and I would just like run the list like you do on inpatient, like run it over and over thinking that like looking at the list would make the things, items disappear. Um, that doesn't work. Um, so I wanna show you kind of the system that I've tweaked over many, many years, um, what it looks like. So in general, I, I still think the foundation is sort of getting things done or that kind of like idea. Um, but then to actually make space for what happens, I put it on my calendar, like they mentioned on the podcast, but even when I did that, there it wasn't helpful. So I wanna give you some more tips on once you put it on the calendar, things that might help you. Um, first, let me orient you to my calendar. Um, in blue are my clinics or meetings, essentially time that um, is sort of like focused on something. I'm not going to be multitasking during those times. Um, so that's it doesn't matter if it's dark blue or light blue. So that's the blue pieces. And then um, the parts in gray are sort of my administrative or flex time, the times that I could put in like tasks or projects. Um, so the first thing, first strategy I want to talk about is Eat the Frog. So Eat the Frog is a book by Ryan Tracy, but the phrase itself comes from Mark Twain, who said, if the first thing you do each morning is to eat a live frog, you can go through the day with satisfaction, knowing that it's probably the worst thing that's going to happen to you all day long. So in this context, what it really means is like the frog is your most daunting task. It's like your biggest task. It's the most important one. Maybe it's the one that you most might be most likely to procrastinate, um, but you really need to get it done. So you need to eat the frog first. So you need to do that thing first while your mind is fresh, while you're at the beginning of your uninter uninter uninterrupted time. So you can have most of your brain power to get this frog done. Um, I really like this concept. Um, uh, one, because it 
forces you to actually identify your frog. So it forces you to be intentional about what you are doing. And I think for many of us as doctors, um, we get a lot of tasks that we just feel like we have to do. And there's not a lot of intentionality. So we have a reflex to like do it, but this is to like back off on that a little bit and be like, okay, what is really the most important thing um, that I need to get done? Um, and Claire is gonna talk about the Eisenhower matrix, which really also promotes intentionality. And um, so these kind of dovetail into one another. So first thing is eat the frog, figure out what you really need to do. And that needs to be your first task. A lot, I would also just put, when I started doing that, I was like, but I could do these 10 tasks first before I do the one task. It's very tempting, but you gotta eat the frog first. Um, the next thing, um, is right size your task. And so for me, what I mean by that is when I first started putting things on my calendar, I just like took like all my tasks and I put it into the gray spaces, just like all of them. And then I would get to whatever Tuesday afternoon and I would see these 10 tasks and I'd be like, oh, this is like 12 hours of work that I put in a three hour block. That's not realistic. It makes me feel bad about myself. It doesn't actually help me plan because I'm not going to get these things done. So right size your task. Like, so you can actually see um, the way the way I do it now is I actually try to estimate how much time things are going to take me. So um, on Tuesday or the second column in, you'll see it says STFM prep three. So like, I think that's going to take me about three hours and I have a three hour block. In general, though, I actually try not to fill up the whole block of time that I have because inevitably there are like, you know, 30 minutes or some amount of time stuff that you kind of just have to get up that crops up. Um, but at least this has prevented me from putting like literally eight hours of work into a two hour block. So um, right size your task. Um, you can click Claire. The other technique that is sort of similar to this that a lot of people use is the Pomodoro technique or um, which is uh, Pomodoro means tomato in Italian. And um, basically it's a common technique people use where they'll use a timer. It doesn't have to be tomato, but it'll be cuter if it is. Um, a 25 minute interval timer is sort of the, or tw 25 minutes is the common interval people use. So you like, uh, work on a task for 25 minutes, and then you take a five to 10 minute break. And then you um, do another cycle of that. You do three, four total cycles, and then you take a longer break for 20 to 30 minutes. And what that does is it sort of forces you to like take whatever large project you're doing and like break it up into doable chunks. So that right, right sizing that task for 20 minutes. It also is aligned with sort of our attention span. So for those of you who are, have been thinking or doing a lot around like um, adult learning principles, like knowing how much time our brains can actually spend on a task. So that those are kind of how those two come together. Um, the next thing I do is I actively move and assign tasks. So what that means is like sometimes the STFM prep doesn't take three hours and maybe it I go down a rabbit hole of like literature review and I don't finish it. So then I just like move I uh, like forward to see like, when's my next gray space that I can do a little bit more work on my project. So I'm sort of like managing my week as it comes so that the moment I have the time, I'm not like, what is it I should do? Like I already know. Um, and then the last thing is forecast, forecast, forecast. Um, and what that means is like, again, another example with STFM, like for this talk, for example, I knew I was giving it today on November 10th. Um, so I looked at my calendar before November 10th and I was like, when is it that I'll have a couple of hours to like, look at this? And I just block that time out. So I'm saving spots as bigger projects come along so that I don't overextend myself. And so I also know that I can get things done in time. Um, having said all this, this is always a work in progress. Um, so I'll just share the things that I am working on. Um, for me personally, self-care often gets bumped. And um, again, Claire will talk about these Eisenhower matrices, but I, I really like them. You'll see uh, oftentimes the like high priority, but low urgency things for me in that quadrant are the things that I'll overlook. And I they're, they're high priority though. So I really am trying to figure out a system that will like float those up higher. Um, 
And then this is idea of parking lot. You can actually do the next slide. This is actually something I was been working on for a while and this system has now started to stick. So um, I had was having a problem sort of like organizing like not larger projects, but like little things that I just needed to track or as Claire mentioned, like conversations that I needed to have with specific people. Um, I used to put it on like a big Evernote and I was like, couldn't find it or forgot to look at it. And so now I'm using Trello, which is free. Um, and it's actually intended to be more robust than the way I use it. I essentially use it as like glorified post-its, but um, each of these, so I have like different columns, like the first column is on repro work that I'm doing. The second column is on the whammy network. And then under those are each little tabs. You can click on each of those. So if you were to click on repro advocacy projects, you might see like we're trying to uh, make sure that we have methogen in the clinic or something like it has a bunch of projects within that that we're using. And you can link to like an email or whatever references you need. Like under Ying, I have all the little things that I want to talk to her about. Um, so this, this system has started to work for me in, as a idea kind of parking lot for things. Let's pause there and see if people have comments or questions. You can either drop questions in the chat or raise your hand and um, then we can unmute you. Hi, Joe. Hey, um, I think just FYI, the chat is disabled, so people can't um, just like type in the chat. But um, one like very rote question that I have is like, how do you deal with like different um, forms of technology that have calendar functions? Like, I find that like like you, it looks like you were using Gmail, but like I get overwhelmed with that because it's like my residency uses Teams, and then like you also have Trello and so like I don't know if that resonates with you guys but like it's something that comes up a lot for me like I get um yeah just overwhelmed by like all of the different systems that other people are using and I find it hard to consolidate into one thing that works for me. Claire and I actually do different things here I think right so I actually so I agree with you it is crazy making when people everybody wants to use a different calendar um, I just want everyone to use the same one, but so I force it all to consolidate onto Google. So the reason like those blues, I said, don't worry about the blues, but that darker blue is importing my outlook into my Google, but Google is where I keep like all my family stuff and the kids stuff. And so I need a place where I can see it all. Um, so that's, I, I think consolidating to one calendar for me is key. And then Claire does it differently. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it ends up being about the same. I have like my, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and switch to my next slide here. Um, but I have my um, insane looking Google Calendar. <laughs> um, and essentially, I put like important things from Outlook into there, and then it pulls in my Am I on. Um, I, I will say, yeah, it's not perfect. And I, I don't have a great solution for that. But that's, that's what I found to make sure that I'm not like putting work things on top of um, family things or vice versa. I think um, Dr. Gravel had a question. No, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I hit the button by mistake. Okay. But I really appreciate your presentation. Oh, no, no problem. Thanks for, for being here. Um, well, maybe um, since I'm on the slide, I'll, I'll go ahead and show you all my system um, and, and then we can um, definitely take more questions at, at this point before we move on to um, the next piece. Um, and, you know, just to reiterate, as Grace said at the beginning, this is um, not at all to say that this is the system that you need to use and like we figured out the perfect fix for how to not, you know, drive yourself crazy with how many things you have to do. Um, this is just, you know, a couple of examples of, of how we have made things work, at least for now. Um, so I do a lot of the same um, kind of overall pieces that Grace does um, and, you know, kind of those same getting things done um, overarching ideas. Um, but I do have a little bit of a different system in that um, I still use a paper planner and I really love my paper planner. I do not get paid by Hobonichi 
um, to <laughs> represent their product, but I do love it. <laughs> um, and part of why I love it is because it has um, a page for each day of the year. And that's where I like put my um, tasks. Um, so I, at the beginning of the week, I do my kind of like weekly review, um, which is another um, getting things done idea. Um, and I you know, look at the week ahead and look at the week behind and really like put all of my things out onto the um, uh, each day of the week. Um, and I map out my little calendar here. Um, and this is actually my like pre-visit planning um, so that I, this is a, I've made this page as an example. These are not actually patients, um, but uh, I've, I'll do my pre-visit planning here. So then I just take this notebook with me to clinic as well. Um, and then this gives me kind of an overview of my day, which helps me to think about what tasks can I actually get done in this day? Because this is a pretty, pretty busy day for me. I have like teaching at 7 a.m., then I have clinic in the morning, then I'm precepting, and then I have another meeting at 7.30 p.m. Um, so the idea that I'm also going to like, you know, put together a, a big talk during that day is, um, that's not gonna work for me. <laughs> so um, I use my paper planner um, for, for that piece. And then um, to put tasks as they come up, either as they arise in my head or I get emailed about them, whatever the, the in is, then I'll put them on that particular day. Um, and it really requires, you know, kind of knowing myself and my, um, being honest with myself about what I can do, as, as Grace said, not trying to put eight hours of work into a two hour chunk of time. Um, and for me, it's also about like the complexity of the task. Um, so as an example, um, you know, when Grace and I were initially planning this talk, um, actually almost a couple of years ago at this point when we gave the first iteration of it, um, then I knew that there was kind of a bunch of action items that came out of um, that initial meeting to make the talk happen. So one, I needed to listen to the podcasts. At the time I had a newborn and I knew, okay, I can listen to the podcast like while I'm breastfeeding. So I'll put that on a day that I like, I'm doing a little bit more like newborn care. Um, that, you know, responding to Grace's email, I could probably do that during precepting. Like I can usually respond to a semi-complex email while I'm precepting. Actually like making the slides. So doing like the deep creative work um, that for me is something that I cannot do during precepting. Like that is a, like, I need my, my full creative brain on. And for me, that usually is like early morning uninterrupted, at least like an hour worth of time. Um, so I, so you see like, that's not on this busy day. I did not try to give myself that task. Um, and then, uh, setting up the meeting with Grace again, that's when I go to my um, Google calendar, which does have pulled in like um, both am I on and my husband's calendar and <laughs> our like house task calendar. We have too many Google calendars. Um, but I would, I, I put my meeting with Grace, um, you know, on my Google calendar and uh, also will give myself a little reminder on the day before on my um, Hobonichi page to prep for that meeting if I think it's something that needs prep. Um, maybe I will stop there um, and see yeah, any any questions about either of our systems before we kind of move on to uh, the next piece which is the size and power matrices Um, well, we can always come back at the end too. Um, so we're gonna kind of yeah move out of the getting things done in our um, particular day-to-day -day systems to um, think about a different uh, way of framing all of the things that you are trying to do in every day. Um, and that's the Eisenhower matrix, um, which does come from President Eisenhower. <laughs> um, but I think it's not an idea totally unique um, to him, you have probably run into it in other spaces before. Um, and it's really about categorizing tasks into whether they're urgent um, and then whether they're important and recognizing that those two things are different um, and there can be overlap in, um, in multiple quadrants, right? Um, so this first quadrant is things that are both urgent and important that you should just do right away. Um, the second quadrant is a really important one that Grace brought up earlier that um, important things that don't have urgency to them and that we should plan so that they do happen, 
but um, can tend to get pushed off because they don't have that sense of urgency attached. This third one, urgent but not important, I think can be um, one of the harder ones to conceptualize. Um, and it would probably be better if it said urgent, but slightly less important. Um, and that's like a lot of the things that come up with us during the day, like, you know, an email that like you really should answer like today or tomorrow. Um, it's not like, oh my God, you need to answer this email right now or someone is going to die. Um, but um, it's still, an, it, so it's a slightly less important thing to do, but you, but you do need to do it eventually. And the things that are not urgent and not important, then um, again, just gleefully trash. Um, so an example of that, um, that is, is not um, particularly family medicine uh, specific, but I think can resonate is if you have a baby that's crying, that is urgent, it's important, you need to attempt it right away, kitchen fire, um, you know, some, as I said, some calls that come up. Um, it does have like interruptions and distractions are kind of in this quadrant three, but other calls that like are important, you need to do them, just maybe not right, right now. Um, trivia and busy work, time wasters, and then all of these things up here in quadrant two <laughs> that are actually really important. Um, so, you know, that big idea that you've had for work or, um, you know, a, a family project that you want to work on, a vacation that you want to take, um, all like really important things um, that don't necessarily have the sense of urgency attached to them to push them to the top of your list. So we're going to ask y'all to um, take a couple of minutes now um, on your own and hopefully you have something to write with um, in front of you, um, a piece of paper and a pen, if you can grab one to kind of sketch out your own matrix. Um, and we are going to ask a couple of people to, to report back. So think about if you want to, to be brave at the end of this, um, residents especially if you're willing to, but um, anyone. And think about all of the things that you did yesterday and try to put them in the four different quadrants as you do that. Um, just all, all of the tasks that happen, um, especially the ones that you had a little bit more control over. We'll give you maybe two minutes to do that. Um, just in about two minutes, so start wrapping that up, um, and then we're going to give you another minute to think about the tasks or the things that you deferred yesterday. So anything that you were planning on doing or that popped into your head, you thought, I don't have time for that today, um, or just ended up not happening, um, and try and put those into another matrix. And we'll give you maybe a minute to do that.
Um, so does anyone mind kind of sharing anything that surprised them from that process or other reflections that you have on it? Curious if anybody saw any patterns or like any of their quadrants were particularly full with things. And I know I've put my residents on the spot a bunch already. So if, if there's other people who want to jump into, that's fine. Um, this is Lena again. I can speak briefly. I won't go into too much detail about my quadrants um, since a lot of it is related to patient, specific patients and patient care. Um, but I did notice that a lot of the things that I deferred are um, kind of relate back to that concept of like eating the frog and are just things that I just feel like a tiny little pit of dread in my stomach um, thinking about doing. Um, and then also I think the other thing that I noticed in terms of patterns is that I have deferred um, kind of speaking to also what Joe mentioned about switching between between like different systems and different calendars. I did tend to defer like when I'm working at clinic, I tend to defer things that require me to be on like S Swedish or Providence Epic or like in Outlook and like Providence SharePoint or things like that. Um, so I think for me, figuring out a system or a way to make that integrated a little bit better um, into my life so that it's not such a barrier, <laughs> um, perceived barrier for me to do things. Claire, there are a couple comments. Yeah, in the Q and A. Yeah, I was seeing um, a couple of people. Um, Adriana brought up that emergencies changed um, all of their plans, and they need to accept that. Um, and I think you know that's that's a really um, you know common, and uh, I empathize with that a lot. That you end up deferring a lot of things because other things that are more urgent and more important come up. Um, and the acceptance of that and that your, your list is not going to look perfect at the end of every day is um, really, yeah, an important part of uh, keeping your, your sanity. Um, and then Rui brought up that as a resident, they see that their urgent and important was more filled than their other quadrants. Um, and yeah, I think just acknowledging that, um, you know, resident life means that you're doing a lot of urgent and important things every day for 80 hours a week. <laughs> um, and you have all of your urgent and important things outside of work too, and that uh, it can feel really over full. Um, and that, that is just a, a tough place to be. Um, and that's you know part of our goal with this talk is to help you um, not feel as overwhelmed, even though like you do have to address um, so many urgent and important things. Any other reflections from, from folks? Um, I'll just bring up yeah one more thing that Grace had mentioned before and that we've heard often from um, other people when we've given this talk in the past is that um, this quadrant two, the um, important but not urgent, um, does get to get filled up with um, you know those those things that are really important to your well-being, to you know the well-being of those around you, and those are the things that seem like they're the easiest to defer. And doing that over and over again really contributes to that burnout that we talked about at the beginning. So having some recognition of like what is in that quadrant and am I deferring it often, um, I think can, can help with that and, and coming up with a plan for how to not do that. The other thing that we've talked about in the past is um, is the urgency real urgency or is it someone else's sense of urgency <laughs> or maybe procrastination your own or someone else's that has um, turned it into something that feels urgent. Um, and 
kind of you know thinking about strategies for um am i getting you know feeling kind of like hyped up about this thing because someone else is pushing their urgency onto me and and how can i you know meet that um, sometimes with calmness um, and and really thinking about the priority of how urgent is it really just have one other comment um i I recently, so I, I shared with you all the thing I'm trying to work on is sort of like self, self-care and sort of integrating some of my like non-work specific things. And so my partner and I have started putting this um, Eisenhower matrix on a board. Like we used to just have a to-do list of things that we needed to do. And so now we have like quadrants and when there's a task that we need to do, we try to put it in a quadrant. So we know like, First of all, do we see eye to eye on this like urgency important kind of um, matrix? And then we try to focus on, on the ones that are of highest importance. And so we start, we just started doing this like uh, a month ago. But an interesting came up where thing, I was looking at the list and in high urgency, high priority said like clean carpet stain. And I was like, hey, um, what why is that there? And my partner was like, oh, well, I get confused by this matrix because like it's like a two minute task so like I should just do it right like getting things done like that's high high um like importance and urgency because I should just do it and I was like yeah I mean I like getting things done too but I think this is supposed to like promote like what is really the most important to us like so is there something about that carpet stain (laughs) like and so we had this like interesting conversation I thought just like we're trained to be like two minute thing do it but like is that the right reflex to have all the time always I would argue no, and this can like kind of help us back off on that. So the carpet stain is still there, by the way, because it we we agreed it was lower urgency. Um, anyway, yeah, I think the in previous times when we given this talk that also uh, we were surprised by how much it turned into kind of like yeah, like couple like managing with your partner at home and like <laughs> almost some like relationship negotiation tactics <laughs> um, and and. Um, after Grace told me that, then now on our list, our, our home list is discuss whether to buy whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, yeah, I'm pro. Um, All right. Okay. So we're going to transition a little bit to email management, which sadly all of us have to do. Um, so next slide. I would love to see by raise of hands, how many mes- messages so old and new, but only in your work email. And if you have multiple work emails, total those all up together. Um, how many messages are in your box? So it doesn't matter if you've read them or haven't read them. Raise your hand. Let me open up this thing so I can see. Um, raise your hand if it is zero to 30. One person. Okay. And then if you can lower your hand. What about 31 to 100? A couple more. This is making me anxious for the other choices here. Okay. Um, 101 to 500. Right. A couple more. So we're going to have a non-normal distribution. And then greater than 500. This is amazing. You guys win. Um, Okay, cool. So we're going to talk about email. Um, And there is, if you like Google this or look it up, there's a concept called like inbox zero, um, which I think there are some good strategies in there, which we'll talk about. Um, I'm not sure if I'm like, everybody has to get to inbox zero, Um, but that's just like a nice term. If you're like, I really want to learn more about email stuff, you can Google that. But I think we can all agree that email is a big problem. We get a ton of it. And it actually, I would sit, I would hypothesize that very few people here would say email adds to their lives, like adds so quality anything to their life, right? And most of it's in that low priority quadrant, but we do have to get it done, right? So like, how do we manage it and sort of like complete what's needed so it doesn't just like clutter our minds? The lucky thing is, is that you can manage email with a getting things done framework. So same thing, four Ds, um, and we're going to just go through the framework as it applies specifically to email. Next slide. So the first D is the most 
fun. It's delete, right? So I'll tell you the first year that I did this talk, I actually like, I looked some stuff up, but then I was like, all of this is like corporate America advice. What do people in family medicine really do? So I interviewed a bunch of um, program directors and then faculty that were recommended to me as having like good skills in these areas. And I asked them what they did with email. And like a lot of them were like delete, and then one of them was like, delete mercilessly. So I added that on there. So you have permission from the family medicine community and leadership to delete mercilessly. So like, what does that mean? Okay, so unsubscribe when you can. We get a bunch of stuff that like you don't really need. Um, but the second bullet is probably the most important is to really like think about when you get the email, are you really ever gonna do something about that email? That's the internal conversation you need to have with yourself, no one's listening, no one's watching, but be realistic about it. Um, and whatever you decide, don't feel guilty about it. Someone sends you an article that you're like, I think it's interesting, but then you're like, pause, am I ever gonna read it? And the answer is no. Well, the answer is no, delete it. Like, don't let it be on your inbox, your inbox of shame that you're just like all the articles I thought I was supposed to read, like take it off. And like read an article that you are, no, the answer is yes, I'm going to read that article and then find a time for that article that you want to read. So be honest with yourself and then and delete it if you're really not going to do. Um, and then, so this deleting stuff should be pretty like brainless and quick. And this is something like, you know, we've talked a lot about use these like quick tasks um, to do when you have low mental energy. Like I, I forget when faculty or somebody was telling me like, that they just like do that at night when they're like trying to get their kid to go to sleep, you know, their brain is dead and the kid's still crying, crying. They're just like, delete, 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 delete. So that's like a great, a great use of that time. Okay, next slide. So the next D is defer. Um, and this one I think is actually kind of complex. So, um, or uh, how you have some options of what might fit or fit for you. Um, so the basic idea is like, put it somewhere to do later. And so some people have like, if you are somebody who gets a lot of articles, like we'll have a to read folder um, or like a someday folder. And then I think the trick is also, then you have to like have a, when is that someday or when is that reading time? So maybe you then put a block on your calendar that's like read. And that means go to your read folder and you're reading those things. Um, snooze it is something that I found recently that I really love um, on, Outlook and Gmail, at least, there is like a little clock icon in which you can make a message, um, like snooze, send it away, and then have it come back to you on another day. And I will often use this for like, like, for example, for this talk, I had, um, you know, Emily sent us the links to these talks and some sort of like instructions. And I didn't want it sitting in my inbox because I didn't want to like read it all the time. I didn't really need to know the Zoom link, like the 40 times I looked at my email since she sent it. So I snoozed it and I had it come back to me this morning when I needed it. So like, you know, so anything that's like kind of a, you need to know it, but it's like time dependent. So registration for a conference or like, whatever it is. So snooze it, get it out of your face and then have it come back when it's relevant. Um, then, so the other thing with defer, I kind of alluded to this with the reading the article thing. Like once you just, if this is an article you wanna keep and read later, you know, you put it in your read folder, but then like make time to actually do it, right? You're deferring it to actually do later. Not necessarily, the outcome isn't just a clean inbox. It's like, so that you know what you're doing and when you're gonna do it. Um, and then generic reply with time frame. So that's like, you know, you're really busy, you know, you need to get to this uh, and it, you want the other person to know, right? So like to your program director, like I got your message, I'm on nights, I'll get back to you, right? And then snooze it to when you're off nights so that you can actually reply. Um, and then we talked about this also, defer anything that's gonna take more than two minutes um, to do. Next slide. The third, third D is delegate. Um, so this is really, um, you know, we get some stuff that is actually not meant for us, right? So in that case, you want to like forward it along to the people who it's really um, for. But I think more often, I actually get something where someone's sort of like looping me in, but I'm actually not the next step. Like I'm the step after that, or I'm the step three steps down. So I still sort of have to track it. So what, um, 
what I actually, this is something I've implemented after reading when, once preparing for this talk, um, like last year or something, I have a waiting folder. So I reply to the email, or if I don't need a reply, I just put it into the waiting, but sometimes I'll reply and be like, yep, happy to help keep me posted or whatever it is. And then I put it in the wait. I CC myself and then I put it in the waiting folder because it doesn't need to be in my inbox because I can't do anything about it right now. It's not on me, but I do need to like help out later. So it's just like out of my face in waiting. So I know where to get it. And when it comes up again, then I'm, I'm ready to go. There is a caveat to this. So when you delegate, you don't want to do this when you're delegating. You don't want to just throw the Frisbee to an unsuspecting poor dog. This No dogs were harmed in the making of this PowerPoint. Um, so don't use this D as an excuse to just like pass off work, right? Um, and you don't want to initiate delegation over email. That's really like a conversation that needs to be had. And Claire made this really good point um, last time we gave this talk that is that early People early in their careers will often get thrown tasks that they haven't agreed to. Um, and so it is a skill to learn to throw the Frisbee back, which is a skill that is beyond the scope of this particular talk. Although I did want to make one proposal of something that could work that fits in this talk, um, which is, as you remember, there was one that said sort of like give a generic reply, right? Um, so like you could, you get a Frisbee, you didn't want that Frisbee, you never asked for it or agreed to it. So you might have a generic reply that's like, thanks for thinking of me for this opportunity. Let's meet, that's the defer part, to discuss what can be deprioritized so I can do this, right? So you've turned this like Frisbee that you don't wanna catch and you like kind of thrown it back, but to defer and have for conversation later, right? And you don't have to accept that Frisbee. Um, Next one. And then the fourth and final D is just do it, right? So if it's a small task, just do it. Um, a couple of other just like email things that I thought were worth bringing up that don't fit into getting things done. Um, but so one is in my reading and my conversations with a lot of people, folders are very personal and everybody has a very strong opinion about it. So um, like in the corporate like literature, there's a lot of like four folders only. And this is sort of like what they rec uh, recommend, like action required archive someday or maybe and then waiting. And then um, other people are like as many folders as you want. Um, and there's like a great divide. Um, so I think I think um, all of this is very personal, but just sort of know like you might be like, I really can't parse down to four and that doesn't feel right for you. Like, yeah, a lot of people are with you there. And then for you might also be someone that actually when I parsed it down it was really really helpful so like what I hear when I'm talking to people about this like um the people who are like really want or fewer are like I spent so much time trying to figure out like did this email go in this folder or that folder and it was like time wasting and a huge cognitive burden so having less folders was sort of more uh, or better and then for other people who are like the sky's the limit they just want you know like they want things to to go in their space so whichever um Okay, and then next slide. Oh, go ahead, Claire. I think, um, well, we have someone, oh. someone posted a, a question in the chat um, that maybe we can talk about after the end of the email, but I wanted to speak up for the more than 500 emails in their inbox crowd <laughs> um, as someone who does no folders and just uses the, um, like, if I've read it, then it's done. Um, and if I haven't read it, or, you know, if I've marked it as unread after reading it, then I need to do something about it still. Um, but I think that is, I, I at first felt a lot of shame that I had <laughs> literally thousands of emails in my inbox. Um, but I think there there are, you know, approaches that don't involve folders if, if you're one of those people. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I see the Q&A. We're actually very close to doing Q&A. We'll, so we'll save that and circle back to it. Um, okay, next slide. And then this was, just like, I wish someone had told me this when I was sort of starting out. Um, you probably know a sense of this. So the first thing is just like, if there's a charged email going around, do not participate in that. It's so tempting to, but just don't do it. Um, do not write an email when you're emotional. An email is forever. If you have to write it, um, you can kind of put it all on the, on the screen. 
but leave the to field blank because you know you think oh people don't actually hit send but then they say hit send because it's like habit and then yeah they regret it so leave the to field empty save it as a draft sleep on it and then decide later um someone told me this quote and i just thought it was so funny and also accurate so the they told me dance like no one is watching email like you are being subpoenaed so that's like the principle for email um and then that last one is don't respond to emails on vacation so this is like a tough one and i really encourage people to try it on i will say when I started doing this, it was a lot better. And also as somebody who emails people when they are on vacation, if you email me back, what you're telling me is that you're actually kind of available and that you're looking, you're like, okay to do emails, right? If you write me back while you're on vacation, that is not going to make me want to email you less. So think about what your intent is when you actually respond to people when you're on vacation. Um, yeah, Claire. I'll add, Grace, because um, you gave me this advice a while ago, and I've, I, I feel like I'm like a recovering email addict in some ways, um, especially when I'm on vacation, because um, it's, you know, can, when you like even open your inbox on vacation and see like, oh my God, I now have 120 emails, and I am coming back my first day from vacation and straight into being on call and in clinic, um, just, and wanting to do something about it, I have started to um draft emails and then wait to send them until the day that I get back um or use that like you know re reply in the future function where you can schedule an email and just schedule them all to send um, like the first day then back or, or whenever I want them to go out um but I do think it has cut down on um the amount of people kind of trying to get my attention when I'm on vacation and like me engaging mentally in those conversations as much to just like write my reply and then be like, it's it's done now. I'm not like going to think about it anymore. Um, and if you can get to the point where you don't even open your inbox on vacation, then um, I am very impressed. I have to like not have internet access for that. To I love that. Thanks for sharing, Claire. All right. Um, so those are, you know, yeah. So those are the strategies we wanted to share with you. And um, it would be great I would love to actually hear. I don't know if people, we, what we, since you could just put in the Q and A, if you're willing to put in there, like what strategy lit up for you, that would be really great. And we promise we won't lose this question, your question, David. Did anyone have a strategy that we mentioned that they thought might work for them? Yay, a vote for Pomodoro. Great. Maybe while people are thinking about it and typing it in, we can um, talk about this question um, around designating specific time for email, email or tackling it through the day. How do you minimize it as a distractor from other important tasks? So um, I kind of do it both. Um, and like I said, I, I had interviewed a bunch of like program directors and faculty, and a lot of them actually are very specific about uh, my email day is Wednesday at whatever time, or like I block the last hour of my day always for email. So I think that is really, really helpful. Um, for me, since you all saw my calendar, sometimes when I see my email, like, um, getting a little bloated in the task. I'll put like email two hours or whatever it, it, it is. Um, but I do some, I also do kind of tackle it throughout the day, but um, I don't do anything that takes more than two minutes. It's very like the minimal, like that end of night while your kid's falling asleep kind of email. I do that during the day, but thinking email or like that stuff, I block time. Claire, what about you? Yeah, I, I tend to hop in and out of my email, which I think is probably, um, yeah, when I like want to procrastinate about a different task, that I'm like, ah, see what's going on in my email right now. Um, I do, I have started to um, address my epic inbox at like a specified time and just once a day instead of going in and out. And I have found that that has made me a lot more efficient with that because um, I was spending so much time like 
yeah, just hopping in and out of my inbox all day. And now just like sit down and do it once and like clean it top to bottom and then not go back in again, unless there's something urgent. Um, and I think that would probably also be a helpful strategy with email. Um, I think part of it is accepting that um, even that kind of urgency and other people's urgency piece of um, anything that you like really had to address today, like probably someone would not email you about hopefully, or at least, you know, if I check my email, like in the afternoon at some point, um, then it's okay if I maybe don't open it again, but um, it can, that can still feel anxiety producing for me, but maybe there's things in my email I haven't looked at. Um, I don't know if other folks have uh, responses to a particular technique that kind of lit up for them or um, that they want to try in the future. If you want to drop those in the chat, then that's great. Or we can also just take general comments or questions, or if you want to share something you've done, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. And that either, feel free to type something in the Q&A, but um, also if you raise your hand, we are, are happy to kind of yeah, have more open forum chat with folks now. Love that, Joe. Yeah, the calendar piece is, is really important. So um, I'll just share that. Um, in terms of the Q&A, that that is something that um, not everyone can see. So we have um, okay. somebody who just shared, used Pomodoro for studying way back when, but we'll definitely try to bring that back for other types of work now. Um, I'm also curious if anyone yeah, feels brave and wants to, to raise their hand and um, talk about reflections or if you have like a different technique or like something else that you use in your organizational life that um, you think would be helpful to, to share with everyone. I also do want to encourage like um, people are like, I struggle this with this one thing, but I don't really want to ask, ask, because um, again, like Emily said, this is going to be recorded and we want this to be useful for you. You're probably not the only one with that question. We might not have the answer, but it would be great to just have a conversation about it if there's like a pain point for you when it comes to this kind of stuff. Adriana asked about showing the matrix again. Oh, go ahead, Mina. Hey, um, I, after kind of listening to the Getting Things Done podcast, um, I also am a big fan of kind of writing things down physically and paper, um, but just for kind of ease of use, I ended up trying some of the apps that are, that are kind of aligned with the Getting um, Things Done philosophy, I guess. Um, I'm currently using Todoist and Grace, I know you had mentioned Tre Trello, I believe, um, but I was just wondering if anyone else had suggestions for kind of apps or other kind of technology functionalities that have been helpful um, for them. Um, did you just say use Todoist? I don't, I 
use, I use Microsoft to do, um, which is Microsoft bought, maybe it was just called to do it was better before Microsoft bought it but now anyway I use that but I'd actually that's more I don't actually put work tasks on that actually that's more like a grocery store to do list kind of deal um other technology I have tried um Evernote I think I mentioned that mm, it was fine <laughs> um I'm trying to think I don't know, Claire, do you use any technology? Um, yeah, I've, I've tried some different ones. I mean, I have Evernote for like kind of more like taking actual notes on talks and stuff. Um, I tried Google Keep for a little while as a place to keep lists. Um, but yeah, I really found that like the act of writing it down physically was more helpful for me than um, using like a particular app. Um, but yeah, curious if other people have. Thanks. I can just jump in real quick and just uh -huh. say that uh, Trello, a lot of people use for getting things done matrixes and like you can find templates for getting things done just like pre-built for Trello. So hopefully we have another hand raised. Yep. And a couple Q and A, but I'll, Molly, why don't you go first? I was just going to sort of echo Lena's thing. I also am like constantly on the search for like a good piece of technology to keep things organized because I do tend to like to write things down and sort of like in like when I have a moment of time, that's when I'll like sit down and write out the things and then try to see like, how can I fit this out into like the next few hours, the next day, and then the next week. And that's like pretty much as far out as I can handle. Um, and I just had a meeting with my advisor the other day and Lena, one of the things that um, Carrie had mentioned is there's a new function on Outlook called Planner which I think is like similar to the like to do or whatever. And they're using it now for the Jerry fellowship. And it does seem like pretty cool and customizable. Like you can kind of make it checklisty, but you can kind of like chunk it also by like when tasks are due. So it kind of turns into a calendar. So it's something I'm going to try, but I also just want to emphasize that I think one of the things I struggle with the most is like, I'll try a new piece of technology or a new technique and then it's hard to stick with. And while I like to write things down, then like as soon as I'm not with that piece of paper anymore, or even if it's in like a planner, like I can't control F it, so I can't find it later. And then that sort of gets lost. That's all. But anyway, the planner function is something I'm going to start trying. Somebody did suggest OmniFocus. Mark suggested OmniFocus, which possibly was designed with getting things done in mind. I. I'm not familiar with that. Um, Mark, if you would like to share a couple of words, if you're in a space, you can do that. Um, please go ahead. I don't know, Emily, if you can unmute Mark um, DeBay. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yes, I've been using that uh, software. It's an app and also it is uh, online. And uh, so we can we can sync all your information from uh, your phone or online or, or in an app uh, computer. It's been uh, around for more than ten years. I think I think that's when I started using that. It is a little bit uh, complex, but when you get to it, you understand how it's structured. It's uh, particularly convenient to keep track of uh, tasks and projects in the idea of a uh, GTD. Awesome, thank you. Also, you can uh, email task directly there. Uh, there are a lot of little features like this that are convenient. So I'm using that on my main uh, uh, space to keep track of all these things. It syncs with the calendars as well. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'll have to mm -hmm. check that out on the focus. Claire, do you want to answer the question about um, the episodes of the podcast? Yes. Um, so um, David asked if there's specific episodes of the Getting Things Done podcast that um, we would recommend. Um, and the ones that we kind of sent to the residents ahead of time were um, episodes one and three for folks who are kind of, yeah, both new to getting things done and um, feel like organization is kind of not one of their stronger points. Um, and then a couple of other good ones are. Um, episode uh, 17 and episode 25, um, I think are both kind of 
nice, you know, next steps in the process that are kind of more like optimizing your GTD system. Um, so those are good ones to start with. If you just even just Google getting things done podcast, um, then it has all of the episodes on their website. Um, but it's also on like Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and all of, all of the other podcast places. And uh, um, Adriana had asked to scroll back up to this matrix um, to take a picture. So um, there you go. I do you have another comment or question? Oh, no, sorry. Hey, Frida. Am I still unmute? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was talking while I was still muted. Um, can Can you all hear me? We can, we can hear you now. Yeah, we could. We could. Oh, okay. Could yeah. Um, I did not get the luxury of signing on at the start, but I'll definitely be looking out for the recording. But I really was excited to like just tune into this because um, I mean, I am two years into attending life, and I still feel like. I don't have a good system to not fall behind. And I feel like it's just an ebb and flow, but there are some movements that are better than others. And I'm sure a lot has been shared um, thus far. I think one thing I wanted to share in case it didn't come up is I think for me, I tend to struggle more with emails that have a lot of tasks required to them. And, and in this like weird, like kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, I just take longer to attack it, even though I know it takes longer to actually go through the work. So it's just this like sort of spinning wheel of just being tardy with responding, because I know it requires probably more than that two minutes that I, I think some like one of the hosts was sharing, like try to answer those at a set short time. And so I think one of the things that has been helping me like with the decreasing time to respond, which usually requires you to do some of those tasks, um, is actually starting the email and like trying to write the email as much as you can without referencing any additional things that require you to look up another tab or go into a folder. Because I think for me, that's where I kind of go in a loop and then I just don't respond. And, and then it's like, oh, I have to do an additional step. And then I, it discourages me. So I think definitely not underestimating tackling emails in parts, I think also helps with those like higher like action items or higher volume of like product required for that email reply. So I just wanted to share that, that yes, you can like draft an email, start it and then come back to it as you continue to like tackle the mini tasks in between. Um, can I just make a comment? Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a really, really um, good tip. And it also like in one of the podcasts they talk about, or somebody maybe called in and says like, I have stuff on my to-do list that just sits there forever. Like, and um, I think we all have things like that. And so one is, does that need to be on your list at all? So, right, that's question one. But the other thing I found for me is oftentimes the list that are the things that are on there, it's because like that item is actually not one item. It's like seven items, right? Like I can't make movement on it because I haven't made, it's not the immediate next step. And that's one of the things with the getting things done. And I think what you're talking about where it's like, here's an email, it's like actually seven tasks all bundled together, but like, yeah, breaking it down into like, what's the immediate next thing I do? Like maybe I draft a little email about that mini thing and then like I come back to it. And so that's a really good point. Like what's the immediate next thing you need to do and like chip away at it. So thank you for bringing that up. That's also a really good reminder to me thinking about how often I'm on the other side of maybe sending an email to someone and being like, oh, I also have to ask you about this complex thing and maybe this other complex thing and realizing that like if you if I want a response to the first thing that I probably shouldn't hold in like a million tasks to one email um, or, or at least be explicit that like, you know, it's okay. I don't need an answer to all of them right away. Um, I think Mark, um, is your hand up? Would you like to say something else? Yes, actually, I wanted to ask uh, the uh, two speakers today. So the reason why I signed up for this meeting because uh, is because I was in, um, curious, uh, interested 
the idea of indeed presenting this topic and uh, within a residency program. I used to be a program director now I'm on the faculty, but I, I think it's important indeed for a team or a group of people to have uh, some kind of a common understanding of uh, the way we work and the way we manage tasks and so on. I think it makes things uh, easier. So I was, uh, I just wanted to ask you whether uh, you are trying to do something like this to kind of facilitate the, the relationship with the resident and the faculty to make sure we understand each other. There's no uh, undue delays or uh, uh, frustration on how people uh, respond to tasks and that type of thing. Um, I think I, I had a little bit of trouble hearing you right at the end, Mark, but it sounds like um, you're you're planning on, on hoping to do a, a similar session with your residents and faculty to have kind of like a shared mental model of, of how to um, respond to tasks and, and kind of organize things. Is that right? Yes, yes, somehow, yes. I think it, it would be a good thing to do. I haven't done it yet. That, that's why I was, uh, I signed up at, uh, for this uh, webcast that I was asking you whether you've done something like this. Like obviously you do already, but uh, even more systematically, you know, you could kind of all agree on the way to respond things and follow up on tasks. I think some, uh, a lot of uh, organizations uh, are doing something like this and implicitly uh, adopting one or the other model. But I think it's a, probably a good thing to do within a residency program as well. So Mark, that's a great question. And so our talk or what we've been giving this talk that you saw today and the other iterations we've done really are more focusing on like the individual and how the individual might manage within a system. And I think what you're addressing is like, how do we create a culture where we have a shared mental model of, of how we respond to emails or what, like, do we send 10 task emails or like, you know, our expectations on when emails are, um, what's expected for a timely email reply and stuff like that, which our talk really doesn't go into, um, but I find it's really, really interesting. But I would say like the skills we've talked about today really um, are adjacent to the skills or the culture um, that you're talking about. Um, but that would be like a great thing to establish, I think for um, residents, for anybody at your institution, because it is, there are different norms, right? It's like the hidden curriculum kind of stuff um, at different places. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I guess also you can uh, help people identify their goals, for instance. Uh, so we know that everybody has some kind of a, an idea of where we, they want to go, I guess, you know, even for educational purpose, purposes, we are supposed to define learning objectives and milestones and so on. So I think you can link all these uh, together, just make sure that um, president and faculty have some kind of way to organize these common responsibilities and common tasks. Hmm. Anyway, I understand that's another, another step. Yeah, that's a great kind of like second level um, idea that, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll think about something in the future about that. Um, okay, I think we're kind of hitting right at 90 minutes. Um, so if there aren't any kind of last last minute questions, um, we'll start to wrap up, but um, really appreciate everyone being here today um, and uh, seeing some familiar names, which is really fun. Um, and thank you to um, my residents for all coming and, and participating, appreciate y'all. Um, and yeah, Emily, anything else that we need to, to do to housekeep? No, I don't think so. I just really want to thank both of our presenters, Dr. Shi and Dr. Thompson, for sharing some really wonderful, um, um, well-earned um, pearls of wisdom and some great things to carry forward into the future as we all that try to have um, clear eyes. So thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all who attended and shared your ideas of what we can do in the future. And yes, we will have recorded this session and we will be sending out the link to all registrants afterwards and posting it on the SDFM website. So just thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.